Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Joshua Allen Young. I'm one of the producers and organizers of XR Safety Week uh, for the XRSI. Uh, today is our fourth day of, of our uh, full week of content and the theme today is all about medical XR. And we're just so excited to see everybody here uh, in the room and for all the people joining us via YouTube or maybe watching this after the fact. Really happy to have you here today. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, Divya Chandler, um, who is the founder and CEO of Lucidify and a, one of our, our medical advisors here at XRSI. And so let's go give her a, a warm, warm emoji welcome. <laughs> And uh, Divya, please introduce yourself and um, let's get rolling. Oh, thank you so much, Joshua. Um, I love the, these emojis. <laughs> um, well, welcome everybody, wherever you are in the world joining us. Uh, today, we're gonna discuss the future horizon of extended reality in medicine and healthcare. And we're gonna spend the first part of this talk speaking of its amazing promise. And then we're gonna talk a bit about the new risk landscape that emerges and finally talk about some mitigation strategies. All right, so when I think of medical XR, I place it broadly into three buckets. The first is immersive education. Uh, the second one that you see there on your screen is diagnosis. And the third one is treatment. So we're gonna start with the education bucket. Now, medical education and immersive learning using VR, AR, and mixed reality is, is just a huge part of what medical XR is today. Make no mistake, Meta, which was formerly Facebook, is really interested in this space, and so are all the other big players. Now, this, uh, this is a great place to start. Uh, this is my friend and dear colleague, Dr. Shafi Ahmed, a surgeon who is actually in this audience. He is in the UK. Uh, in 2016, he performed the first live stream surgery in VR, and he continues to build a platform and opportunities to participate in surgery in the operating room or even surgical rounds of patients uh, so that he can continue to teach and reach a large audience in real time. So he's going to tell you a lot more about his endeavors in his next keynote. But the important point I want to make here is that this is really important for access. Now, medical education can be imparted without having to be supported by a large, expensive medical school infrastructure. In fact, medical education is really expensive to do. Uh, it's everything from the instructors, uh, the classrooms, and even the cadavers. But you can be trained with almost all the classroom skills and knowledge and many of the hands-on skills from anywhere in the world if you use a mixed reality platform. So this is an example of an attempt to build virtual classrooms from a group in Canada. And now HoloLens um, is being increasingly used uh, to augment ed medical education. Uh, now, I just wanted to let you know that there are other glasses uh, for augmented reality, including Magic Leap um, and Apple soon to be released glasses. Uh, and they're all involved in these sort of collaborative medical frameworks. Uh, but with Microsoft's Mesh, which is a mixed reality platform powered by its Azure Cloud service, uh, is to enable people in different physical locations to join 3D holographic experiences on various devices. So you could use a HoloLens 2, but you could also use a range of VR headsets, smartphones, tablets, and PCs. And in a blog post, the company imagined avatars of medical students learning about human anatomy gathered around a holographic model and peeling back muscle layers to see what is underneath. You'll see that here in this video. Um, so here's a, a student in a virtual classroom you're going to see, uh, and he's starting up, out by blowing open various layers of anatomy. So you'll see that right here. You can see that he's sort of pinching and moving things around. And now you see an instructor with a group of students who could be situated anywhere in the world sharing a 3D anatomy lesson together in the same space with all of these students. They're also able to understand pathology in the body by walking around the body in three dimensions. And you could see them here studying different forms of fractures of the lung, bone of the arm, which is called the humerus. Now here's another example of HoloLens being this time at the University of British Columbia, there is an instructor there. Um, she and her students have created a simulation of the brain called Holobrain that enables them to teach neuroanatomy. 
And ultimately, this is really the promise here. What mixed reality can do is enable us to see three-dimensionally, which is so important to helping students learn realistically. It's often really hard to understand the body's three-dimensionality from just a series of, three, of 2D static images that can actually change from patient to patient. Cadavers are also really, really expensive and they're a limited resource. And also there are some malformations that patients may have that are really, really rare. So how do you study those? So we're gonna see how that might work in the next video of the Stanford Virtual Heart Project, which is there to teach students residents and even parents of children with congenital heart disease to understand some of these anomalies. Hi, I'm Dr. David Axelrod, a pediatric cardiologist at Stanford, and we're taking medical education to a whole new level. Medical trainees will be able to see and touch a living, beating heart right in front of them, so they will be able to have a whole new take on how to learn about the heart. We're starting with congenital heart disease, which are structural defects of the heart that people are born with. They'll be able to actually go inside the heart to see the difference between a normal heart and a structurally abnormal heart with congenital heart disease. Our virtual heart goes so far beyond what textbooks, plastic models, and even cadavers have taught medical trainees for decades. It gives them a vivid, three-dimensional sense of how the heart works and what happens when it's not working normally. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. I can see some people with their emojis. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. David Axelrod, a pediatric cardiologist. Sorry. Perfect. So um, this is really near and dear to my heart. So I'm a practicing anesthesiologist. And the bread and butter of our training, believe it or not, started with simulation before we were even able to touch patients. We're much like pilots that way. And there are two simulation initiatives at Stanford where I practiced for eight years. One is run by my colleague, Dr. David Gaba, and he runs this thing called the Center for Immersive Learning at Stanford. And they are actors and instructors, co-learners, all of us participate in learning scenarios in built real world environments that mimic the operating rooms at Stanford. But they're increasingly moving to a mixed model of simulation in VR to teach these skills. And um, there's something else called the Stanford Chariot Group that has put together mixed reality training for cardiac anesthesia residents as well. And this might be interesting to all of you, it's something you might not think about, but in fact, um, in order to maintain my anesthesiology board certification, I have to do simulation every five years. So there are new programs that are constantly arising to enable me to do this um, from the comfort of my home rather than going to a simulation center in person and by the way um, these simulation centers are pretty expensive and that brings up another value of xr medicine it's the ability to maintain skills over a lifetime of practicing medicine i mean if you don't do something enough and you don't practice you you lose it uh, a great example is during COVID, a lot of pilots were furloughed from uh, various airlines how many people um, were that comfortable with a pilot who hadn't been flying for about a year getting back um, in the controls of a plane? And that's something that Medical XR enables us to do is to get our skills back. Now, nowhere is this more apparent than in procedural fields of medicine. This is an example of a company called Precision OS, uh, and they enable trainees to learn how to do orthopedic surgery in VR. Now, this training can be done anywhere, just like the simulation I told you about, even from the comfort of home. And this brings up another point of medical training in VR. Uh, a trainee can practice on a mannequin, a hologram, or an asset in the XR world that's not the real patient. Importantly, they can make mistakes. They can learn how to do things that would be painful to a patient before they're learned well, things like placing an IV line or doing a spinal tap. And they can also learn how to do skills that if they're not learned properly, harm a patient. And that includes invasive procedures like placing central venous lines, arterial lines, intubation, or surgeries themselves. Now, I found this really interesting. Um, they've actually been, um, publishing outcomes of some of their data in training residents. Uh, here's one of their studies in which they randomized 18 trainees to either a video-based skills learning environment or one in virtual reality. And you can see that many of the cognitive skills that translated into real world skills were markedly improved by using VR, even over watching a surgery performed over and over on video. And this brings home another important point. 
trainees are often, when they finish a program of residency, they're often overconfident about the skills that they understand after that training program. And mixed reality will allow both trainees and instructors to gauge skills acquisition. Otherwise, it's really hard for instructors to see what the student is doing and what they know. This is another orthopedic surgery company, also VR, and they're training surgical residents in collaborative environments in the operating room. And this brings home another one of the benefits of simulated training in XR. You can create virtual and augmented environments like the OR, the emergency room, the intensive care unit, where groups of trainees and different types of healthcare providers, including doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, they can all work together to master teamwork in scenarios, including crisis scenarios. Team coordination, believe me, I've been in this in the real world, that can save a life. So <clears throat> medical immersion training, I would say it emphasizes teamwork and cognitive skills. We talked about practicing things over and over until you get it right without people having to watch you and judge you. Um, we also talked about skills assessment, maintenance of skills over a lifetime, and we talked about access to people who wouldn't otherwise have access. So we're not quite at the Star Trek holodeck yet, but ultimately we'll get to a point where the, the simulations become even more real. And the holy grail will be the integration of, believe it or not, real world objects with the virtual world. So you can touch and feel things and manipulate. So if you need to infuse blood or deliver a shock, it helps to touch the machines. And that brings up another point. There are new things like haptics and gloves and other accessories in XR that are getting better and better and will contribute to the immersive learning environments that we're building. Okay, so now we're gonna to move to the potential of medical XR and diagnostics. This is also a huge and very bucket. Uh, it embraces a number of things, including, and very, very important to, to our fields, situational awareness. For instance, augmented reality, these heads-up displays can make it possible for anesthesiologists and surgeons to be able to continually monitor patient vital signs wherever the patient or the real-world monitor is in their field of view. Phillips initially worked on this with Google Glass. I don't know how many of you remember Google Glass. Um, now academics and startups are working with major augmented reality glass developers to build this for medical practitioners uh, using current technologies. Now here's an example of one such collaboration. Uh, this is a new telemedicine application for, uh, that is using HoloLens uh, and it promises paramedics and emergency medical technicians a new tool for diagnosis and treatment of patients in the field. It's designed through a partnership between a medical software company called Excellus and HoloLens developer HoloForge. The application is called Nobadik and it leverages gesture-based commands of the HoloLens to give the practitioners access to customizable modules for patient assessments, clinical exams, and patient profiles. Here's another interesting use case. Um, this is the ability to continually um, monitor the effect of chemotherapy and radiation for cancer patients. Uh, in this particular um, uh, figure, which comes from a paper, it's a, this, this group is using 3D reconstruction of a breast tumor shrinking in response to therapy. Superimpose this on real world skin of the patient during surveillance exams to enhance their understanding of the efficacy of the therapy. Now, um, SRSI's um, medical co-chair, Ryan Cameron, who is also in the room with us, he's the founder and the president of a company called Electric Puppets, and they are revolutionizing the real-world eye exam by recreating it in virtual reality. So eye exams, for those of you who have them, they're really cumbersome, they're time-consuming, they require expensive equipment, necessitating a patient come from wherever they live to an eye clinic with all of this equipment, and this could be prohibitive in terms of getting the exam. Then you have notes that are taken by human in doing the exam and depending on how good a note taker they are or how sparse the notes are, um, it's really difficult to learn about the patient or reproduce results. So how about a more comfortable exam recreated by Ryan in virtual reality, one that has inexpensive hardware requirements and can be done from the comfort of home or at least in remote locations that are more accessible to patients. So there's increased precision, increased compliance, and even better patient access. And you use the system to do medical research as well. 
So finally, we get to medical therapeutics using XR. And again, there are so many innumerable use cases that we can't go through, but I'll show you just a few examples. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. This is the treatment of young pediatric patients um, during very painful procedures using distraction. Um, so for instance, like a lot of kids uh, in these burn units have to have these very painful dressing changes. Uh, the Stanford Chariot program is has been building um, virtual games for kids to distract them so they don't even notice that the dressing changes are happening. This has the additional benefit of limiting the amount of anesthetic drugs and opiates that we actually need to give the child. Um, there's another example of pediatric pain distraction. This application is called Snow World. And it's a VR app developed for children in which they can throw snowballs at penguins and snowmen or just go along for the ride. And this reduces the pain experienced by burn patients by up to 50%. Uh, and as one child said, it's just white noise to me. I wasn't thinking about anything. I was just shooting snowballs. Um, okay, so this is uh, Augmetics. Uh, this is showcasing another amazing use case. They're an Israeli company that um, has developed the first and only FDA approved augmented reality headset for surgical image guidance. So they have this thing called the X-Vision Spine System, and it allows surgeons to visualize the 3D spinal anatomy of a patient during surgery as if they had X-ray vision and to accurately navigate instruments and implants while looking directly at the patient. So rather than having to constantly look up or to the side at a remote screen, and they want to revolutionize how surgery is performed by giving the surgeon better visualization, control, and accuracy. Now in the United States, in uh, 2020, over 250 spinal surgeries were performed with this system, and um, they just raised a $36 million Series C funding round. So it shows that investors have confidence in this type of uh, medical XR. Now, this is going to be my final example that I show you uh, in the therapeutic space, but this one is just so extraordinary. I had to do it, and it's very dear, and get, uh, dear to my heart. Um, this showcases the power of VR for people with spinal cord injury and people who are paralyzed. In this image, you see a paraplegic who's paralyzed from the waist down due to spinal cord injury. And this patient is in a robotic exoskeleton harness. There is a non-invasive brain reading device that reads his thoughts and his desire to move. This is interpreted by an algorithm and it's translated to the exoskeleton, which actually can carry and move his legs forward. So this um, enabled this patient to make the opening kick for the 2014 FIFA World Cup. So just understand here, he's paralyzed. He is using his mind to control a robotic exoskeleton to kick this soccer ball or football, uh, depending on which part of the world you're from. Now, more importantly, these um, patients in the Walk Again study also trained in virtual reality. So as these paralyzed patients actually imagine using their legs and walking, there was an avatar of them that also walked in the virtual world. Um, a half to feedback was even incorporated by being delivered to different parts of their body other than their legs because their legs lacked sensation. Now, the end result of this is actually quite extraordinary. Um, this very uh, modest paper was published, but what they described is that um, all of the patients that they had trained in this combination of, uh, you know, this robotic exoskeleton, this haptic feedback, and this virtual reality training, they all regained some form of limited neurological function after spinal cord injury. In some cases, it was just control of bowel or bladder function, but that is a huge deal for people who have lost control. Uh, one patient was actually able to start walking again a little bit under their own power. Understand this is without invasive surgery, stem cells, CRISPR, any of these new technologies, simply by the power of visualization that was enhanced by feedback in the extended reality world, a damaged nervous system was partially restored. This is the power of medical XR. And that's why it's not surprising that it has been used in the field of stroke rehab as well. There are a lot of companies that are building medical XR applications for stroke. Other notable use cases include things like mental health uh, and treating people with PTSD. Okay, so this brings us to a really important topic and one that I wanna make sure that we have some time to talk about here. 
In the process of doing all these wonderful things, many of them aided by sensors, an enormous amount of personal data is being collected. And the question is, how is this being protected and secured? Uh, and this came to a head, of course, when Facebook recently announced that it had a name change to Meta, and it was focusing its efforts on the metaverse. So when Mark Zuckerberg mentioned the Oculus headsets being part of Meta's product line would be available either at major discounts or even at cost, there was a commenter who said that the reason for this was that the ultimate goal of Meta was to monetize your data. So <clears throat> whether this is true or not, uh, there is a perception out there that this could be dangerous. And so the question is, what are the guardrails for systems like this and for what we're doing in the metaverse? Um, is it governmental regulation? I know for a fact that it has to be a global effort. So I want to introduce you a bit to the kinds of data that can actually be collected in this world. So there are now devices that pick up low energy gestures. So they either measure muscle activity coming from your wrist. Uh, and something new that I saw at the Augmented World Expo just last month, there is a device called Mudra that can actually pick up non-invasive nerve conduction from the wrist. And that means if you make a movement, the device can measure your muscle or nerve activity translated to movements in the virtual world. And this can be used to manipulate objects or assets in VR like the arrow you see, but it can be also used to uniquely identify you. Now, there's a company called Neurable here, and what you see is they've developed an EEG headset that you can wear concurrently with a VR headset. It measures brain waves while you are in the virtual or augmented world. The question is, why is that important? Turns out that your brain waves can be hacked. This is a study from the University of Alabama in Birmingham and what they did is they found that if subjects were wearing an EEG headset, typing in a password, they could hack it and decode it. Now, imagine you want to purchase a digital asset in the virtual world. Rather than taking off your headset, you can use your brainwaves or your gestures to type in a password. This could be read and it could also be hacked. Now, <clears throat> there are um, a whole host of things that can also be done. By measuring brain waves and eye tracking and things like pupillary dilation, companies can now read your unconscious interactions with products or scenarios. They can gauge interest, attention, and where your eyeballs are going. This is a whole new field called neuromarketing. And this world could increasingly turn into a type of metaverse shown in the film Minority Report. Um, many of you might be too young to remember Minority Report, uh, but in this particular scene, you see um, personal ads being targeted to the Tom Cruise character as soon as he enters a shopping environment. Turns out um, that facial recognition is now following us around, sometimes without consent, in major shopping um, environments as well. Now, here's another example. Uh, this is Poppy Crumb. And she is the chief scientist at Dolby Labs. Uh, sorry, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's it. And uh, she's describing the ability to read heat and carbon dioxide emitted from your face and your mouth in order to gauge engagement, excitement, and fear. And it turns out that your brain waves can also be used as a brain print. That's correct, a brain print. So here you see an example of Sarah Laszlo in her lab. And what they're doing is they're putting very reduced uh, sparse arrays of electrodes on um, subjects. And they're showing them basically images and they're measuring their brain waves. And they found that they could identify a subject with 100% accuracy doing that. Now that would be great for things like authentication that might not be able to be broken. But you could also hack that and you could use that to say recreate that person. And um, as we move on, it turns out that you can actually record people's brainwaves non-invasively, perform some machine learning on that, on data that was trained in another database for things like addiction or uh, mental illness. And you can actually decipher which people um, are likely to have addiction problems or things like schizophrenia um, without having to really ask any questions. So the question is, what could be done with this data? Could you be denied a job? Is this going to be the new way of getting a job rather than, say, peeing into a cup and deciding if you are drug free? Uh, could you be denied health insurance? And ultimately, I say that we are moving into a world in which we can be digitally twinned. Um, 
turns out that you are using an Oculus headset. Now there's all kinds of sensors that can measure your biometry. Things like brain waves, eye tracking, pupil size, your voice, your low energy gestures in the ways that I showed you with a Control Labs device or a mover and your body's movement. So a really very realistic digital twin could be created of you or a deep fake that was absolutely indistinguishable from you, at least in the virtual world to start. Who owns that? Is it gonna be Facebook Meta or Microsoft? Um, to give them those permissions. Who protects that data? Who can hack it? Who can recreate a simulacrum of you and commit crimes in your name, open loans, wipe out bank accounts? Uh, that's actually been done already by imitating people's voices, which are pretty um, a pretty good way to identify people. So there are movements afoot to protect the most precious data, including the read technologies that can be applied to your brain. Um, and that dovetails nicely with sensors that can be worn during the AR VR experience. Chile has specifically taken uh, steps to protect those neural rights by writing a neural bill of rights, literally, into their constitution. Um, and I just want to introduce the idea, and we won't be talking about it today. Uh, yes, here we go. Um, that there are future internet architectures out there um, that actually protect the data itself and the data producers. That's you as the end user. And these are decentralized networks, they're not the blockchain, but they enable users to have more control over their data and actually authorize who their data is shared with. Um, and that's the work and mission of XRSI. We are working to build privacy and security frameworks around data uh, that's collected to protect users that will be interacting in this global decentralized and empowering new world. Um, Ryan Cameron, uh, one of our advisors, uh, has made a great intro video to watch to understand this framework being built. You can see it at this link, so definitely take a screen capture of the link. It can also be found on the website. Uh, and what I wanted to end with is to say, I hold these statements as realistic approximations of where we are right now. Um, XR is going to enable unprecedented access to healthcare and wellness. It's an opportunity, however, to collect enormous amounts of the most sensitive human data, and we have a duty to protect and maintain biosovereignty as a tenant of human rights. So I am really excited to have all of you here. I appreciate your interest and your joining us, and I hope that we can form a community of stakeholders. Thank you guys so much.